In this hour, we'll revisit the worst prison riot in history. This week in 1971, prisoners rose up against the guards at the Attica Correctional Facility in New York. We'll hear from one of the leaders of the riot as he recounts the graphic details of the siege and its aftermath. This week in 1971, police and National Guardsmen fired more than 2,000 rounds of ammunition in just six minutes, bringing an end to the siege at the Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York. But what caused the riots to happen? And what hard lessons are still being learned in the aftermath. We find out more. The 1971 uprising at the Attica Correctional Facility is the bloodiest encounter between Americans since the Civil War. Not until 29 years later does the United States District Court in New York finally award $12 million in damages, not to the families of the 11 corrections officers killed in the uprising, but to the inmates who lived through the worst prison riot in history. You know, you can get a zillion dollars. They still wouldn't pay me for what happened to me. Tensions simmer in the summer of 71 at Attica, the overcrowded state prison near Buffalo. You know, they didn't have no minority officers in there, no Spanish-speaking officers, but you got Latin inmates. 88% of the inmates in Attica are African-American or Latino, but 100% of the guards are white. They had a manifesto that was going around, you asking for a change, asking for the warden to be changed, asking for programs to be changed. But nothing changes at Attica until September 9th, 1971, when guards are attacked. Keys are grabbed, and suddenly the prisoners rule the roost. Freedom, really, that's what it was like, yeah. But it is freedom with a heavy price. The inmates kill two fellow prisoners and mortally wound William Quinn, a guard. Although he is released with other injured prison staff, he dies shortly thereafter. The 1,280 prisoners, armed with knives and clubs, hold the remaining 32 corrections officers hostage in D Yard. Warden Vincent Mancusi, expecting an even worse bloodbath, plans a counterattack to take back his prison. State troopers and National Guardsmen are summoned. Immediately after the inmates' initial chaotic outburst of violence, they organize, picking leaders and presenting a manifesto of 31 demands. Grievances include brutality by the guards, repression of religious practice, and lack of political freedom. Basic education, the medical thing was really out of whack, and we really had a problem on the money that we were making. But the issue that looms largest is the one of dignity. We are men. We are not beasts, and we do not intend to be beaten or driven as such. New York State Corrections Commissioner Russell G. Oswald arrives at Attica. I urgently request you to release the hostages unharmed. Now, I work with these men. Uh, they haven't done nothing to me. I mean, any, any excitement, certain things went on around here, okay. That's understandable. People get excited and things happen. The prisoners keep their guards hostage. When Oswald postpones the assault force to open negotiations, the inmates handpick outside negotiators to hear their grievances and to protect them from retaliation. Frank Big Black Smith is chosen to protect the negotiators. So I organized 250, 300 people to do that security of the yard. Although negotiations progress in good faith for four days, with many concessions from Commissioner Oswald, the state refuses to grant general amnesty for the murder of Officer Quinn. It broke down. They didn't want to deal with the demands, and we didn't want to deal with what they wanted to deal with. So the commissioner said, if you don't accept this, we coming in. We said, OK. In spite of pleas for more time by the negotiators, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, who refuses to go to the prison, orders Commissioner Oswald to attack early the fifth day of the uprising. As the inmates hold their hostages at knife point, a huge force of state police, sheriff's deputies, and National Guardsmen storm the prison. First we've seen a helicopter, then we hear loudspeaker, then we've seen bullets and gas. After 
After five days of negotiations, it took a mere six-minute storm of bullets to end the uprising. Them coming over the wall, shooting and opening up people with buckshots in two seconds. Corrections officers and state troopers round up the prisoners. From one yard, a D yard, over to A yard, everybody coming out of their clothes, stripping, you know, being beat, you know, with sticks and gun butts, made to crawl in the dirt. The guards single out the leaders for revenge. Made me lay on the table and uh, put a football under me and threatened me with castration and killing me. They told them that if the football dropped, they would blow his brains out, and then they proceeded to torture him for six hours by burning cigarette holes in him, pushing into his testicles, and they had him there in full view of everybody else to, as an example. Then they took him off the table and walked him into the gauntlet by pushing a bayonet in his anus. Corrections officers beat rebellious inmates with two-by-fours and baseball bats to get them back to lockup. Once inside, Big Black and the other leaders are turned over to the state troopers. They just went crazy. They played Russian roulette all through the night. The uh, bus cracked my head open and broke my wrists and, and took me to the hospital and laid me on the floor, spread eagle and played shotgun roulette with me. Open your eyes, nigga. Don't close your eyes. We're going to castrate you. By the end of the day, state prison officials announced that 39 people have been killed in the onslaught. 29 prisoners and 10 guards. The state claims that the hostages have had their throats slit by the inmates and one guard was castrated. But the coroner will contradict the state. His report finds no castration, as well as the surprising revelation that all 10 of the guards, including Sergeant Cunningham, were not killed by the prisoners' knives, but by bullets. And only the police had guns. The first eight autopsies were on the cases identified to us as hostages. All eight cases died of gunshot wounds. They had to do something to cover up the error, to cover up the assault, the barbaric things that they did. So the state prosecutes the inmates. There were 42 indictments charging 62 brothers with and uh, stuff that was going to keep them in jail for the rest of their life. And in fact, it was the largest set of criminal indictments in the history of New York State. The Attica Brothers Legal Defense Fund wins four out of the five criminal trials, but two inmates are convicted. And in 1976, Governor Carey granted pardons and clemencies, calling the prosecution the darkest day uh, in the history of New York State jurisprudence. The 1,280 prisoners who were in D Yard seek their own justice in the courts. Minutes before the statute of limitations is about to run out in 1974, they file a class action suit against New York, demanding $100 million for their suffering in the brutal reprisals. Their civil suit drags on 26 years until January 4, 2000, when a settlement awards $8 million to the Attica inmates and $4 million to their attorneys. What is enough? Mm -hmm. I mean, monetarily, Attica is not about that. Attica was about a change. Although New York State has yet to admit any wrongdoing, the uprising and lawsuit did spark prison reform. For 10 years, there was an enormous change in the way prisons were operated. There were educational programs, vocational programs. People were let out of their cells. There was an awareness of prisons that occurred because of what happened in Attica. Through the settlement, we raised the issue of prisons and the nightmare of the criminal justice system. So it was worth it.